Okay, so what I want to talk about is the question of space and safety. <coughs> and to really focus it on, the, on, on university spaces, um, but university spaces as very particular kind of examples of the way in which we organize um, the, uh, our, 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 our sense of, of making ourselves um, safe in, in physical spaces, in social spaces, and, and kind of in imaginary spaces. Now, the two sequences that I showed you, there was a visual sequence of, of, of slides um, and this recording of a personal narrative. Um, I think are really interesting um, when you put them next to each other because they, they, are, they reveal two completely different ways of imagining and thinking about safety and space. The first is a series of images of, of exclusion, of, of actual physical exclusion. We've got the gates, we've got the turnstiles. These are, are, are physical barriers to prevent people entering a certain kind of enclosed space. Um, but what interests me is when we start thinking about that and we start asking what is the thinking underneath that as the strategy for trying to engineer um, safety. Um, and it's immediately clear that it's based on the idea that threats to safety are external. Okay, it's about maintaining a barrier between an inside space and an outside space. And particularly it's based on the idea that, that there are dangerous outsiders. They're people who present a risk and those people need to be excluded from, from, from that particular um, social space. Um, in direct contrast to that, the narrative account which is of a girl sitting on campus um, and noticing a car parked near her, talking to her sister, um, gives us a totally different sense of, of the organization of space and safety. Here we have a campus space that has been violated in a, in a totally different way. Um, the, 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 the source of risk is someone who is legitimately in that space, someone who is a student, someone who has a right to be there, someone who occupies that space kind of naturally and with permission. Um, what it indicates is, it also is a different idea of safety, that of, 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 of danger being located in everyday interactions rather than in the relations between kind of outsiders and insiders. And one of the problems that it throws up, that if you think about that narrative, where she, she, at the point where she realizes her mistake, one of the things that comes up is, it's not very easy in this version to work out who's dangerous and who's not. In the, in, in, in the security version, in the turnstiles and barriers and barbed wire version, there's an easily imagined idea of who the risk is. In this personal narrative, um, discerning who is safe and who is dangerous is a much more complicated um, process. So let's think then about what kind of space a university is. Um, and there's a traditional sort of way of thinking of the, sort of the, the idea of the kind of liberal university um, in terms of it being a, a marketplace of ideas. And the essential thing in this idea of the, of, of the university as a, a specific kind of space is the, the um, the, 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 the exchange of ideas and, and it's built on a, a, a notion of sort of personal development and social transformation that, that, that the production of knowledge, the exchange of ideas, the process of learning is both for individuals a kind of developmentally transformative experience but that, but, but that the university can also produce uh, impact on society, it can produce positive changes in society. Um, but to, in order to do that, it has to be different from other kinds of social systems. It has to be substantially different from kind of authoritarian, political, and religious systems where people experience violence and persecution for holding certain opinions, um, for expressing certain beliefs, for, um, for behaving in ways that are not socially prescribed. Um, so part of the, the sort of this liberal notion of the university is, this, is, 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 is the university as a safe space, as a f space of, of freedom from hostility and persecution. And something that I'm going to write about um, in the near future is it, it, there's also something really interesting about that, is that the university as a kind of a, as a utopian space, as a, as a space that tries to experiment with what democracy might look like if it came into existence at some point in the future. And, and so I'm really interested in that in, in, in the university has this kind of special safe space that's different from, from um, uh, other parts of society.
unfortunately, as soon as we start talking about this uh, Im imagined reversion of the university, we start having to confront the fact that in practice it's not true. Okay, in practice, the universities are sites of fundamental exclusion. Okay, they're sites of economic exclusion, they're sites of social and cultural exclusion, and they're sites, uh, as we saw in that series of images, of physical exclusion. People are physically prevented from entering the space of the, of the university. Um, so not only is the university a site of exclusion, it's also a, a, space, a, a space of danger for a lot of people. It's a place uh, where, where, where threats, where victimization, where violence occur systematically as part of, of the everyday organization. And one of the interesting things is that, that this realization is, it sort of undermines the kind of liberal myth of the university as a safe space. And because of that, it tends to, be, to, to get erased in certain ways. This idea that the universities, the enclosed space of the university is for many people an unsafe space, tends to um, so, so, somehow get lost in, in, in uh, thinking about um, uh, the, um, what, what a university really is. Um, so the question I want to ask then is when we think about making social spaces safe, um, what are we thinking about? Um, and those of you who haven't read it, I, I really want to recommend a paper that Monique's published recently about the breaking down the walls. Um, which looks at the idea of securing spaces by having, by having high walls. And it, and it really gives a kind of a, a, a critique of that. Um, and I'm going to advance a similar line of argument here, but it's, it, it, it's slightly different. Um, uh, because it's not so much about walls, it's about the management of boundaries between safe and unsafe spaces. Okay, so we've already said that those images that, that, that I showed you at the beginning are, th these are images of, of exclusion, okay. Um, and, the, and the criteria of exclusion is membership versus, of the university community versus non-membership. So if you can show your card, you can get in through those barriers. If you can't, then you, then, then you are excluded from, from the space of the university, okay. But the interesting thing is that in practice, that, 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 that process is negotiated in much more complex ways. Um, and one of the ways it's negotiated is in terms of other axes of exclusion, in terms of, of, of race, in terms of class, and in terms of gender. And for instance, this is one of the ways in which, you know, that, that I really notice myself being a middle class white male is getting through security clearances. This is, at, at the point where I don't have a parking desk or a staff card, my ability to negotiate access is massively different from someone who would be perceived as a young, poor, black male who would have really very little leverage uh, in terms of negotiating that access. My ability to negotiate, because I'm, uh, I exemplify a certain kind of social privilege specifically through being thought of as a safe person. I'm thought of as being a low-risk person, uh, as a person who doesn't present a physical risk to others. Um, and, 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 and that's interesting to think about that, is what it means for that, 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 that some members of the university community have this kind of currency as, being, as looking uh, uh, safe, and others, uh, other people in society are immediately flagged as looking dangerous. Um, and what that means about the, our mythology of the university as a safe and inclusive in environment. Um, the, the, the key point that I want to explore here, though, is this idea of the danger within the university environment as, uh, as existing and originating from the outside, okay? that the, the risks um, that are presented to the university com community are presented by people who aren't part of the university community. Other members of societies, other social groups present this risk. And so what we're trying to do is to police the boundary, to make sure that the outsiders stay out and the insiders are allowed in. And clearly, that um, what we see happening again there is this, um, that, that, that a whole lot of, of, of these uh, traditional social prejudices start being the actual means by which this is negotiated, the, these, these, these sort of historical axes of prejudice um, and social exclusion start coming into play. Um, but essentially what we've got is, 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 is this model of safety um, that is based on the policing of boundaries. 
Okay. And I think it's, it's really important that, that when we are looking at those images, we're really grasping and understanding what it means that that is a very, very specific, and I'm going to argue, in fact, deeply irrational uh, model of safety. Um, and here are some of the reasons why. Um, I've done extensive research on sort of violence and victimization uh, 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 in, within universities in the last couple of years. And what's interesting is what comes up once you actually start doing research and analysis is really quite different from what we start um, imagining when we draw on these sort of popular ideas of criminality. Criminality in South Africa is a I mean, it's a huge part of how we imagine the world we live in. We imagine ourselves at risk of criminality, and we imagine who those criminals must be, okay? Um, and, and so a lot of the work that people do in securing their safety is securing their safety against this idea that there are criminals, and that those criminals are, in certain ways, identifiable. Um, in contrast to that, what our, our research findings are is that within the enclosed environment of the university, this mythically safe um, space of liberal education, um, they, they are, they, there's, there's very high levels of violence. Okay? And there's a couple of things about those high levels of violence that are quite striking. Firstly, it, um, it, it, it occurs between uh, legitimate members of the community, people have, who, are, who, who are valid members of that community, students, staff. Um, it occurs between people who know each other um, but also that it occurs according to certain kinds of organization and the ways in which it's organized is that vulnerable groups, groups who are already marginalized and vulnerable in society tend to be the ones who experience high levels of violence. So, so what we start seeing is very high levels of violence against women, against um, gay people and against um, foreign Africans. Um, and when we think about that, we immediately see that these are related to the dominant forms of prejudice that exist in the society, um, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. Um, so there's not a kind of an accidental patterning, that the, the patterning of violence is related to the patternings of prejudice, marginalization, and privilege that, that already structure the society we live in. Um, so what I... Have, I, I'm wanting to talk about today is very specifically just the question of, of, of gender-based violence within, within the university community. Not that the other forms of violence aren't important, but this is one that I've, I've, I've done a particular uh, research focus on. And by gender-based violence, um, I mean quite a lot of different things. Um, not only various forms of violence against women, like sexual assault, like uh, um, domestic violence, uh, uh, what we now actually tend to refer to as intimate partner violence, um, um, but also violence against gender minorities, violence against gay, lesbian, transsexual um, people, um, a range of gender minorities, and violence against, against men who don't represent the dominant um, forms of masculinity within that social world. And one of the interesting things about these forms of violence is that they are, they aren't, they're, they're not acknowledged by, by the um, university management typically. Um, that they tend to be off the radar because they tend to not be flagged by the official mechanisms for recognizing that violence. Quite simply, they tend not to be reported. People who experience uh, rape, gay bashing, things like that, do not go to the campus security services and announce that that has happened. And there's a whole lot of, 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 of interesting reasons we need to look at that. So universities tend to work on the idea that these are very sporadic, occasional incidents. They often take them quite seriously when they do arise. But, but, but what, what that conceals is in fact that these are things that are happening a lot. Um, and you know, one of the really disputed numbers in, in victim studies um, is a question of like what proportion of, survi of, of survivors of sexual violence actually report what has happened to them. And you know, you have different accounts. You have like at one stage in Becky saying, oh, it's like there's a three to one reporting ratio. You have gender activist organizations arguing that there's a 35 to one, that only one in every 35 survivors of sexual violence actually reports it. Um, and that sounds sort of quite shocking, except that our research shows that it's much worse than that. I mean, we, we, we've been discovering under-reporting of 100 to 1 
um, that maybe one out of every hundred sexual assaults is actually getting uh, brought to the attention of the, of the authorities. So there's a kind of uh, sort of veil of silence um, that, is, that is being created by, the, by the, the processes of identification which are simply not working. What we're finding instead is um, that in uh, our studies on women in residence, most women in residence uh, experience relationship violence. The numbers we're looking at are kind of around 80%. And this is, these are this is really astonishing kind of numbers. It means almost every girl who lives in res is getting physically assaulted by someone who she's romantically involved with at some point, a partner, previous partner. I mean, this is way into and beyond the realm of normalization. This, is, this, 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 this means that we're talking about a kind of violence that's almost universal. Um, and half of, 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 of the women in res that we um, studied experienced uh, sexual assaults and sexual coercion of various kinds. And most openly gay or, or, or men who appear effeminate have experienced um, some sort of harassment. Um, and that form of harassment really vary from kind of uh, public verbal harassments through to really interesting from a kind of a logical point of view forms of violence of, of gay men getting raped by straight men. Uh, this seems to be a really interesting thing that sort of falls under this unusual South African category of corrective rape. Um, the idea that by sexually assaulting someone you might change their sexual orientation and, and it, it, it does sort of short circuit the process of logic when you try and understand how that belief may be understood as working. So if we say that intimate partner violence is the real form of danger that exists in universities, um, what do we need to understand about it? Okay, firstly, um, this is violence that occurs in, in relationships. This is not strangers, this is not outsiders, this is not even just acquaintances. These people are intimately acquainted um, with each other. Um, the victim knows the perpetrator only too well. The perpetrator's uh, 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 contact with the victim is something that is totally authorized that starts out as being consensual um, and that it follows certain patterns that often it persists um, over time it's not a kind of one-off incident um, and and in, in many cases it escalates over time and it's not very unusual for it to escalate to the point of of murder I mean we've had to deal with a number of incidents where people have actually ended up being dead in res um, and one of the interesting things about that is that it tends not to be conceptualized in any way. When we, when we have these incidents of like, okay, here, now we found the body of a woman in a restroom, um, which I've, 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 I've actually been through that experience uh, all too many times now. Um, there, there's, there's a kind of an emotional react, oh, this is a tragedy, oh, this is, a, this is a evidence of the terrible criminality of South African society, but there's no attempt to conceptually engage it and say what kind of thing is this, what does it tell us about the way we're organizing our social spaces, what does it tell us about how, the way we're organizing identities, and what could we do about it? Because one of the, 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 the things that doesn't work in these kinds of situations is having turnstiles and fences and barbed wire and things like that. Clearly that boundary policing is absolutely ineffective. It's just the wrong thing to do if your aim is to is to address this kind of violence that, that, that affects so many people. Um, another really interesting thing about intimate partner violence, it doesn't get reported, okay? And it doesn't get reported by the, the, by the people experiencing it, but it also doesn't get reported by the bystanders who are aware of it. And a while ago, we interviewed some girls um, in a res on West Hall campus at UKZN, and um, uh, after the, 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 the murder of, a, of, 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 of one of the, the students in, in, in the res. Uh, and this murder happened on a Friday night. The boyfriend came and had a fight. He stabbed her. Um, and so we asked the girls, well, did anyone notice anything? And they were like, yes, well, we heard the fight. We heard the screams. We heard the beating, all of that. And so obviously the question we then posed is, well, what did you do? when you heard this very violent escalation happening? And the answer was they did nothing. And when we tried to sort of explore, well, what, why didn't you do anything? I mean, this person is dead now because people who could have called support services didn't. 
they, that, 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 that the answer was very clear and unambiguous from everyone involved. And the answer was, well, because this happens all the time. This, that every weekend there will be this kind of thing. We will hear someone, see someone being punched, hear someone being beaten. Um, it's just a thing that happens. It's, it's a normal part of relationships. It's a normal part of being a student in res. Um, and that's what seems to me to be really, really interesting. And it seems that this is where we might want to do our kind of analytic work. Um, is to look at the, the way in which these patterns of violence are normalized and seen as either legitimate or simply inevitable parts of certain kinds of social interactions. And if you're going to be in a relationship, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to risk being assaulted by your partner. Um, the other thing is that we shouldn't just think of it in terms of sort of like physical beatings. That one of the important parts of intimate uh, partner violence is sexual coercion, being physically bullied, socially bullied, psychologically bullied into uh, non-consensual um, sexual acts. Um, an incredibly important part of this, given that we're at the epicenter of the HIV epidemic, is being coerced into unsafe sex practices, not being given the option of introducing safe sex practices in sexual encounters. Um, and, and also straight forcible rape happening in, in, in relationships, um, violent, um, okay. Um, and the other really important thing that we need to think about very deeply about this is then why people don't report these kinds of things happening. And one of the, the, the issues we've, we've already pointed to is this idea, well, because it's seen as being normal. But in addition to that, there's a whole lot of other reasons. There's, there, 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 there's a sort of complex psychological stuff going on around guilt and shame. People feeling complicit in the... In, 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 in having agreed to a situation that then became violent, people feeling ashamed uh, of, 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 of sexual assaults uh, because of the, the kind of taboos and shames or shame around um, female sexuality, people not wanting to talk about things that are, that are understood as being intimate, being private, being personal. Um, and all of these con contribute to this, this massive field of violence sort of happening under the radar and not getting addressed. Um, the other thing that, we, that starts becoming really interesting when we look at that is uh, in terms of the perpetrators. Okay, we've said the perpetrators are, are, are members of the university community, but very significantly they're often privileged members of that community. They often are academics, SRC members, administrators, and the more powerful they are, um, often the, 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 the greater the risk of them becoming perpetrators is. So what we start seeing is, um, is that, that, that people start using their positions of privilege. Um, for instance, we've, we've, we've documented a lot of stuff um, at one university where the Department of Student Housing was allocating res rooms on the basis of, of, of sexual favors. Um, so because there was a greater demand than supply of housing, uh, members of the Department of Student Housing would require students to have sex with them in order to get a res room. Um, we've seen stuff with uh, SRC members, SRC using their power and privilege, their ability to, to uh, negotiate on people's behalf, get them resources, um, being used um, as leverage for um, coercing them into non-consensual sexual situations. We've seen situations of academics uh, making passing and failing courses dependent on, on um, uh, uh, sexual submission. Um, and, and, and so th there's a kind of a systematic pattern in which these forms of violence are linked to forms of power and inequality within the social system. And once again, to think about that is to ask a fundamentally different set of questions than the question of do you have a card to get through this gate? Um, a, a huge part of this is that high status uh, people within the system tend to be protected by the system. It's very hard to go and lay a complaint against an SRC member or a lecturer um, if you believe that they have a lot of power within that institution, that they will be believed and you won't be believed. They will have the power to retaliate and punish you, find a way of making you fail, find a way of excluding you from university um, if you challenge them. Um, and well, th th this sort of plugs into to, to patterns of victimization that often the people who are, who are most victimized are people who are, are relatively powerless. So, for instance, um, one of the campuses we looked at, there was a, a really kind of consistent pattern of 
of young girls from rural areas who didn't have a social network in town, who didn't have economic resources, being particularly exploited by student housing, by SRC, um, in sexual ways because they, they were vulnerable and they didn't have access to means of ne negotiating the, the, the social system. And so, they, 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 so, so this kind of coercion was used against them. Um, now, there's a whole lot of different ways in which this coercion and the normalization of the violence happens. And, and, and here's a set of slides. This is a, this is a toilet just next to my office. Um, and toilets are really interesting places to find out about sort of discourses um, because people can write stuff anonymously. Um, and the interesting thing is that they, I, I, you know, you go on the internet and it's all kittens and inspirational quotes over sunsets and you go into toilets and it's all violence and hatred. And it's, I, I think that's really interesting. So yeah, here we've got uh, 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 a, a, a whole lot of hate speech. We've got a, um, a gay Stabani get out. The same guy is really trying to make this point. Stabani out of here. Um, interestingly, someone starts fighting back on this and says, don't talk to me like that, motherfucker. Um, <laughs> and we've got a, a seemingly a, probably a different person there. Fuck the gays now. Also really interesting. I mean, that why does this... Well, what the fuck are the gays? Sex with gays? What, what's that really about? Who's, who's saying what they? Um, but related to that, um, so we've got this clear kind of homophobic uh, um, violence, kind of uh, harassment that any gay person in that space would feel unsafe, would know that they are objects of kind of, of, of organized hatred and public articulation of of, of hatred and marginalization. But of course, as is normal, the homophobia is also linked to a kind of sexism. So we've got the fuck the bitches and bitch bow down before. So we've got this kind of idea of masculine dominance. Like so so the, the sexism and the homophobia kind of interlinking in, in establishing a certain kind of aggressive, violent masculinity that, that feels authorized in being abusive and controlling towards other people. Um, and it's interesting because once again, this is sort of within the safe space of the university. You know, this is within the the this, this sort of uh, protected uh, space for exchange of ideas. And what we're seeing in the exchange of ideas uh, is the is the, just a presentation of of, of of hate speech there. Um, so, where are we getting with this? Okay, what 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 I'm doing then is, is really contrasting social versus physical safety. That if we're thinking about our, 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 our environments, our urban environments, the, 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 the world we live in, um, our emphasis has tended to be on, on, on trying to establish physical safety through physical means of restraint, through, through these kind of barriers, through... Um, um, and what instead we've ended up thinking about uh, once we start researching and analyzing this is, is um, social ways of addressing um, safety. Okay? Rather than focusing on securing physical boundaries, we, there's been the emergence of a set of interventions that have targeted social safety. So um, Tenji will know back at the UKZN days we developed this thing called the Safe Campus Project, which tried to network um, activist organizations, campus security services, student counseling, um, with academics who sort of researched and understood the nature of the problems to develop a, a, a intervention that both changed the services and the norms within the university environment. One of the other forms of, of social intervention um, on campuses has been student activism. Uh, there are various organizations. Um, this one organization, Students Against Rape and Hate, um, started uh, challenging um, the, the forms of discrimination and violence against uh, women and other gender minorities. Outroads is an organization of gay students challenging um, the violence towards gay students. But one of the really interesting examples of this is a, is a thing that happens at Rhodes called the, the, the silent protest. Um, and the silent protest is an annual event um, and, uh, that, 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 that happens that really challenges um, gender-based violence by challenging the silence around gender-based violence. It identifies what we, what we showed in our studies, 
that this the, that this huge pattern of violence uh, is is happening under the radar. That it's not being acknowledged. That there's there's it's, there's all kinds of reasons why people are not reporting, why perpetrators are being protected, why it's uh, being perpetuated as a, a kind of a massive and normalized social protest, uh, social problem. So what the silent protest does is it tries to re define the social space of the university um, by being this massive public event that, 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 that a large number of people in the university take part in and that, that becomes a, a, an important sort of cultural event in the university calendar. And what it does is it allows people who've experienced these kinds of violence to publicly start um, revealing that, to become part of a supportive collective where they're not isolated, not victim blamed, not um, made to feel that they are responsible for, for, for these kind of private spaces um, um, where, th where they've been harmed, but instead to develop a kind of a solidarity that both provides people who've had those experiences of social support, but also fundamentally then challenges the norms of that social environment, tries to make it a different kind of social space. People think differently about each other, about the consequences of their actions, um, about how to support each other, how not to harm each other. Um, and on a different day, I would give you a longer kind of analysis of, 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 of what this is about. But I think it's, a, it's an inter interesting example of, a, of the university as a, as a social community um, producing a, um, an intervention designed towards changing the, the norms of, 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 of that space. Um, the other point that I was making at the end there is that one of the ways in which these kind of problems have been addressed is by doing what universities do, which is by teaching. It's so by, through various curriculum development initiatives and courses, actually making this an object of teaching and learning and, and study, um, and, and, and challenging the kind of risks and dangers by making them things that we, that, that, that we deal with as um, problems. So what do we want to say there in conclusion? Um, firstly, to identify that our primary risk is not one of violence from outsiders, although our security model is based on that. Um, because our primary risk is not really from outsiders, the, 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 this idea of organizing safety by security, by, by, by um, having effective physical boundaries, isn't particularly effective. Um, and let me just say, my point is not that we don't need to have those things. My point is not that we don't must you know, go out and smash down all the walls this afternoon, because that obviously will, would, 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 would then create other kinds of problematic um, risks. But, but the, the exclusive focus on that as a mechanism of securing social safety seems to be misguided. Um, the other thing that I think is very important is this idea of, of, of making the university a bounded and exclusive space really does contradict this idea of the university as a, a, an inclusive part of society, as a place um, that, that, we're, that, 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 that people have access to and as a transformative space. And what it does is sort of ends up reinforcing forms of inequality, forms of social exclusion, and it undermines the, the progressive role of the university in society. Um, and really the key point of this argument is that our interventions should really think about how to address both social norms and the structural inequalities that make um, violence a part of our everyday lives. Um, the, one of the key points I want to, to, to elaborate just slightly then is the idea of, of, of the educational process of ensuring safety and this idea that, that there are a couple of things we could do as a as university um, and the ways in which you know, what a university can do is different from what other institutional spaces can do. Uh, and, and there I'm pointing to this idea of actually developing ways of offering critical understandings of existing inequalities through teaching, um, of challenging received norms and values, because we've showed that most of these form, most forms of violence are linked to forms of prejudice, forms of, of, of inequality. And to think about how a part of the teaching process can be about developing um, democratic values, developing uh, commitments to equality, and developing nonviolent ways of negotiating social encounters. Um, and so the three things that I would leave you with as perhaps leads of where this kind of work could go 
is firstly developing a common curriculum, which is a, a, a quite a, a sort of important DUT project at the moment, that, that, that thinks about what it would mean to do this, um, developing more effective support services that didn't rely on a kind of a policing of a complainant going with a, uh, to open a case, that, that was much more accessible, nuanced, victim-friendly sort of support services that could be offered and also how we can promote a sort of culture of activism and institutional intervention to deal with the problems of inequality and victimization that are, that are such a, an absolutely structured part of university life. Okay, and that's about it.